Thanks for letting me be here. Thank you, Pastor Dave. There's something we're going to do real quick out of the gate. I, I don't, you guys understand spiritual things, gifting, you're well taught here. It's just sometimes you hear words, you hear things in your heart. Everybody that, that would need prayer for healing is important, obviously, but sometimes you hear a, a word. And I just heard the word arthritis while we were singing that song when you shared that testimony. And I'm just going to obey it. I'm not going to try to figure it out. But I just believe if you have any level, trace of arthritis, you're on medicines for arthritis, you have pain in your body, I just want you to stand real quick where you're at and obey and act quickly. Because I'm telling you, I believe this thing will change. When you hear a word from the Lord like that, it's very important to just act on it right out of the gate. If you're near them, just touch them. You're family. You're the body of Christ. The Spirit of God is in, in you. The kingdom of God is in you. Touch them. I'm telling you, I'm believing for change in this house right now when we pray. The authority of heaven is in this room. Jesus is Lord. Arthritis, you come out of the body of our people. You come out of every joint, every muscle pain. Leave them now in Jesus' name. Every joint be restored, be whole, and be healed. Begin to move, begin to check, begin to feel right now in your body just areas that were bound. Father, right now, let, let them be loosed, everyone. Be loosed. Just pray that over them, church. Be free, be loosed, be healed in Jesus' name. Not one trace of arthritis, not one trace of pain remain in the body. Father, now we just thank you for breathing on them and blessing them. We thank you that today is a different day than the rest. And we thank you, Father, there is never a drawing back to the same old. That today is a day of change. That liberty has come in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for freedom. No more aching through the night. No more woke up in the middle of the night. No more throbbing through the day. Father, I thank you that even on the job, there is just freedom in Jesus' name. I thank you that morning time is going to be a joy time. And I thank you there is freedom in the name of Jesus. Now you bless them and just believe God. and Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. There's a lot of times you see things immediately change. There's times you go to bed and see that things have changed. There's times you wake up. Check your bodies right now. I need you to check your bodies. Move your fingers. Check your hands. Check your neck. Just check yourself. I want you to let me know right now if anything immediately changed. Who felt something change immediately right now? Just let me know. If it, you did, you did, you did, you did. Who else? Wave your hand. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, forty. There's a lot of people. Fifty. You felt what? Pain leave? Looseness come? What? You couldn't even raise your arm, sir? Not a bit? Look at this. Man, this is awesome. Yeah! Give me a hug. You couldn't raise your arm a bit? What was it like before? Show me how you could raise your arm. That was the best you could do. No, I, I push it up. Oh, you'd have to push it up. Oh, yeah. like, and struggle like that. Put it down. Now just put it straight up. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Who else? Who else? What, what's going on? All the time a balloon feels really... Since you were 16, it's been like that. Did that go away just now when we were praying? It's gone. Jesus, worship him. Just love him. He's amazing. So all you people still standing, you receive change in your body right now. Yeah. Awesome. Crunching. Did the crunching go away? There's no crunching. <laughs> you know, you know, God breathed into dirt and a man stood up. <laughs> it should be a simple thing to believe God for healing. Who else? What, what happened, huh? Heat just go all through. Uh, right, nighttime is a struggle, just laying still sometimes, throbbing, some aching. Yeah, getting up. I see that. No, you're, that's never going to be the same. Give me your hands. This is over. It's a, nothing nobody can do about it. It's way too late. <laughs> this thing is over. Father, I just thank you that she is completely whole from this day forward. There'll never be another night of discomfort, never another waking morning of suffering. I thank you for the freedom of the gospel in her life and your love that's unstoppable. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yay. Is that good? 
Yeah, sometimes you just have to do what God's doing, amen? I just heard that word. You know, you can get all technical. Well, how come? Well, what about the people with this? Sometimes you just hear a word. You have to obey it, not try to figure it out, and just let God be God. Amen? So I'm pretty excited. I'm pumped. I'm really pumped now. I was pumped before, but you know how you get more pumped? So I have to calm down so I can talk now. I'll stutter. I'm... <laughs> Jesus is Lord. Like, look, there's no emotional stimulation possible and no brain stuff possible that can just get him to believe his shoulder's going to work. Come on. It's not mind over matter. Mind over matter doesn't take cancer out of a body. If it did, everybody would get delivered. It's the power of God. It's called love that never fails. Now listen, there's a reason this is in the room, because his name is Jesus, okay? But watch this. The whole gospel is held together by one thing, the righteous judgment of God. The, everything about the kingdom of God is held together by this one thing, that God sees you as if you've never sinned. So if God sees you as if you've never sinned, why would you ever see yourself for what you've done wrong? How about starting where he finished and run well? How about putting on righteousness and bearing your fruit unto holiness? You're not a person trying to get it right. You've been made right. And now the Spirit of God is upon you. And you begin to walk this thing out that's come alive in your heart. Yeah. See? The kingdom of God's not meat or drink. It's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. When you have right standing with God, you have peace with God. When you have peace with God, you have amazing joy. It's good tidings of great joy. We're not trying to be happy people. (laughs) The gospel is here. (laughs) God loves us, made us in his image, and redeemed what he created us to be. And there's no stopping us now unless we fail to see and receive. It's one thing to say God loves you. I'm always right. It's another thing for you to be loved by God. If you see yourself for sin, you'll put a veil over your face and fail to have intimacy. The veil's been removed in Christ. So why don't you look with open face and behold him and love him and be in love? Amen? It's a big deal, man. Oh, I like that. Let me see your shoulder, man. (laughs) I I love that stuff. I was telling Pastor Dave, I got to meet Pastor Dave this week more on a personal level and I prayed for a lady not long ago with a couple people that surrounded her that were in a Methodist church that was liturgy church. They had never prayed for the sick. They had never nothing. And I saw a couple ladies get healed and they turned into warriors real quick. (laughs) And they got to praying for this 92-year-old lady who was completely frozen and completely stiff. And I mean, she went like this when she talked to you. And we watched her like the Tin Man on the Wizard of Oz just come alive and have total use, complete use of her body. We saw a lady whose fingers went this way and she had no use of her hands. And we watched her fingers go. Bam. He is Lord. Yeah. Do you know why it's possible? Because of the forgiveness of sins. The reason it's possible is the forgiveness of sins. It's not because you prayed right. It's not because you said the right formula. It's God's love through Jesus Christ and the righteous judgment of God on the earth and mercy triumphs over judgment and we do not get what we deserve. We get vindication. We get sanctification. We get a clearing of ourselves. We get justification. I don't know if you realize this or not, but sitting in your chair right now through the blood of Jesus, God sees you as if you've never eaten the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Behold the Lamb of God who... What's He do? Okay, so he took it away. So now what? Guess we ought to be sons and daughters. (laughs) Probably ought to just say, yay. (laughs) What did he do? Took it away. Here's the biggest mistake we make. We think that our ability to sin and our ability to miss the mark is who we are. We are what he finished and what he accomplished. And he says we're righteous. And that song we sang is so true. I am all that he says I am. And if he says it, he's right because he's God. Listen, the whole kingdom of God hinges on righteousness. It's the greatest news. Romans 1 says this, that I'm not ashamed of the gospel. 
of, 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 of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's the power of God unto salvation. Salvation is a word soterio. It means more than go to heaven. It's, it's more than just the spiritual forgiveness of your sins and a destiny to heaven. Soteria, sozo, sozo, saves. Soteria, salvation. It means saved, healed, delivered, protected, preserved, made whole, kept safe and sound. That's what it means. When you interpret and when you translate a language from a language to a language, you just take the best word you can find and replace it with the word that you're translating. And the best word is saved. But in America, we think it means, hey, are you saved? Am I going to heaven? No, it means am I restored and redeemed and brought back to original value through the finished work of Christ and have all things been made new? Yes, that's what it means. God did not, did not, God did not, he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Then why would we live for three seconds in condemnation? Condemnation breeds death always. It is never, ever, 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 ever the will of God. The fact that you even have the potential of being condemned means your heart cares and the gospel's changed your life. If you didn't care, you couldn't be condemned. If you weren't pure inside, you'd have no voice of condemnation because you'd be nonchalant and whatever. The fact that you even have the potential to be condemned means the devil's playing on what you don't understand and he's beating you down when you should be lifted up. Condemnation couldn't even settle on you if you didn't care and have a heart inside that was alive. (laughs) Man, I feel born again. (laughs) I'm looking at all your precious faces and I'm so excited because I understand that blood was shed for every one of us. On your worst day, God never lost sight of who he created you to be. I said that this morning. I say it everywhere I go. The gospel is all about God loving us and loving what he made us to be. It's not that he loves where you were and loves what you did and loves who you've been. He loves who he created you to be. And he has held on to that because love never fails. And he paid the price to get the lie off of you and get the truth on you so that you can be what you were always destined to be. This gospel is not about a prayer to go to heaven someday. It's not about fuller vats and fuller barns and blessings. You're set up for discouragement if that's all you think this gospel is. The gospel is about the transformation of your life. It's about you becoming one with God. It's about heaven getting back inside of you and the nature of God flowing through you so the world sees the light that's in you and his name is Jesus. And you don't even have to tell people about him. You just live him and men see. It's awesome. Righteousness makes it possible. Why we could pray a 30 second prayer standing here and see all those people healed instantly. I was in a service and I watched a hundred people healed in 30 seconds. A girl was, was born, 15 years old, born and walked like this her whole life, 15 years old. The only reason she stood to her feet was for an upset stomach because this had become who she is. Because it's all she knows. It's probably been prayed for a thousand times. And you just learn to accept and and you're good and she's precious and she's beautiful. But who knows that God can change that in a moment. There was three people with serious scoliosis. There was three people with cataracts. It was a hundred people in 30 seconds. God just went. She felt hands touch her legs and go like this. And she just walked. The pastor's bawling. He says, this is the authentic power of God. I said, there's nothing else. There's no other. What do you mean? The authentic power of God. <laughs> Three people with cataracts, milky lights, couldn't see to the back of the church. Poop. Perfect vision. Three scoliosis. Yay for you, God. You're amazing. 30 seconds. Why? Because of the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. He bore your and my sin in his body on a tree that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness and by his stripes we are healed. Yeah. God has cursed sin in the flesh. This thing is getting me for some reason. I'm jumping too much, ain't I? I think I'm good. I'll just calm down, brother. I'll calm down. I'll stay right here. <laughs> Look at this. Look at this. First Peter says that he bore, he bore, he bore your and my sin. Where? In his body. There's a cross. I knew there was a cross somewhere back there. There's always a cross. Good. You have to understand that on that cross, 
That's a tree. That's a pole. That represents a tree, a pole. Anything hanging on a pole, anything hung on a pole has been cursed by God. I have good news for you. God did not curse his son on the cross. His son was made to be sin. Sin is what was killing us. God cursed sin in the flesh and sin shall have no dominion over us. For the law of the spirit of life through Christ has made all of us free of the law of sin and death. He put what was killing us on the pole. And what was killing us was sin. And God cursed it. And sin shall have no dominion over us. We are a people of grace. Shall we continue in sin because we're under grace and not under the law? Of course not. How shall we who died to sin? That means it's sting, it's stain, it's memory, it's identity, it's desire. I am not made to miss the mark. I am made to be a son. I am not made to live in the flesh. I am made to live in the spirit. And if I live in the spirit, I will not fulfill the loss of the flesh. So let's be spirit people and get the message and surrender and sell out and become like him come on it's a big deal why why because he who knew no sin was made to be sin so I could become righteous in the sight of God in Luke 24 he raises from the dead and he says man why are you guys marveling at all this and why are you guys thinking about this man I wrote all or I said all this should happen the prophets wrote about all this and he said and here's the reason That the Son of Man would suffer and all that. And he said, here's the reason. That repentance and the remission of sin would be preached to every nation. We think repentance is boo-hoo, I'm sorry. And then we still say conscious of our ability to maybe fail. You can boo-hoo, I'm sorry, and leave a church and still walk on eggshells and wonder when the next time is you'll need the blood. No, repentance is a change the way you think. It should just turn your heart and mind into the proper direction of truth. You know what? I've been living for myself, but I was created for His glory. I've been living for me, myself, and I, but I was made for His image. I'm done in this deception. I'm done in this lie. And Holy Spirit, thank you for receiving me, loving me, transforming me, and giving me grace. I'm going after you, God. That's called repentance. And the remission of sins. We've done a great job. Pow, pow, pow. Repent, repent, repent. We haven't done at large. I'm not talking about this house. At large, we haven't done a great job. Remission of sins. We're fighting a battle he already won. There's two things I personally never think about, sin and the devil. Never. He's a cut off withering branch coming to nothing. I will not put him on a stage. (laughs) He's done. He's never my issue. Jesus is my issue. I'm not a man with a bunch of problems. I'm a man with one big amazing answer. I don't need ministry today. I'm not sad today. I'm not burdened down and pressed down. Life isn't speaking louder than truth. Truth has made me free. It's an amazing day. (laughs) Don't you have any issues, brother? I don't see them as issues. I don't see them as things that are detrimental to my life. I have every answer I could ever have, and it's all through him. And from that place, I live life. Then it's never about who did what and who didn't what, and he said, she said. It's about Christ in me, the hope of glory. What does it matter what someone said or didn't say now that God has spoken through his son? What does it matter what a man did and did did do and didn't do now that God has done something through his son? You have to start there, find your identity there and live from that place so you can run well. Or you're only going to be as strong as the world around you and your circumstances will be your barometer and life will define you instead of the life that's inside of you. Jesus just happens to be Lord and I'm happy about it. I get to see folks that are hurt and get restored. It's a fun thing. I was just in a service and a lady was thinking, I must be such a disappointment to you, God. I must be so disappointing to you, God. I must be so... People think, why do you tolerate me, God? It's amazing. God doesn't tolerate you. He loves you. He's not disappointed. He's wooing you and drawing you, hoping you see and get it. Like Pastor Dave said, that he longs for you to get it. Love's not going, when are you ever going to get it? (laughs) Love's saying, oh, won't you get it? And she's going, I'm uh, so disappointed. She's got a tumor in her belly, sticking out of her belly. She told me it was totally that big, pushing out of her belly. And they're going to go in and cut that thing out. I got to pray for her. I got the great privilege. It was personal that I got the personal privilege to pray for her. And I actually zeroed in on her. It was like, I got through the crowd. and, And when I got to her, guess what I heard in my heart? I heard God say, God said, I am so not disappointed with you. 
No, I didn't know she was thinking for weeks, you're so disappointed in me, you're so disappointed in me, you're so disappointed. But I happen to be a man of God, and he's my father, and my sheep hear my voice. Yay, it's a good day. I'm not trying to be prophetic. I'm not trying to hear the voice of God. I'm just in fellowship with him, and he loves me, and he talks to his kids. It's simple. I'm not, I need a word, I need a word. (laughs) Need one so bad, I come up with one. No, he'll just speak. (laughs) So as soon as I touched her, God is so not disappointed with you. And it came out with bam, and she went, oh. Didn't she? You were there, Arkansas, in the corner. And then I prophesied over something like this. Have I not predestined you before time was? Did I not see you before you were ever seen? Did I not know all your days before any were even written? And here you stand before me, because you're my will and my desire. Oh, how I love you. I didn't even know she had the tumor. Oops. <laughs> but all her friends did, and she sure did. While she's laying there squealing and screaming and bawling and looking ugly like we do sometimes. And she was just <laughs> hair everywhere, man. It was awesome. When she got up off the floor, guess what? She got up changed. She got up free. She got up, and that tumor was 100% completely gone out of her belly. The love of God, the righteousness of God, the truth makes you free. Sin consciousness, condemnation, guilt and shame are not your lot in life. They will never help you. Guilt says I'm not forgiven. Shame says it's still who I am. Condemnation says I'm worthy of judgment. All three anti-Christ, anti-finished work of the Son of God. Yeah, you're not going to see me condemned. Don't you ever make mistakes? Well, condemnation's not my answer if I do. I didn't wake up to make a mistake. I woke up to be like him, my father. Do you know mercy woke you up today to give you one more day to look like your dad? Mercy didn't wake you up to meet your needs and bless your circumstances. Mercy woke you up to give you one more day to look like your father. Because if it's all about you and your needs and your day, you might just use faith to incorporate him into your life in hopes of a better one instead of a transformed one. And you might be a discouraged Christian because you have a wrong view. (laughs) Am I okay? Pastor, am I okay? Are we okay? Okay. I don't know, but sometimes I just see this stuff and it comes out. He came with a sword in his mouth in Revelation. I ought to carry one. It's a good sword. Ugh. Righteousness. I'm on this righteous thing. Got to preach it. It's, it's righteousness. It's the power of the gospel unto salvation. Why? Because men aren't judged for their sins. They don't get what they deserve. They've been completely clean. Justified means just as if you've never sinned. Every one of us ought to stand before him with unveiled face and come boldly to his presence because there's a high priest sitting. Jesus, the son of God on our behalf. Mediating on behalf of God and man. Wow, if you see that, you come boldly. Well, yeah, but you don't know. Stop that. He already knows. And he already shed his blood and sent his son and is wooing you to his presence. Don't let anything keep you from knowing him, church. Man, you can let your Bible knowledge take the place of knowing him. You can let serving in a ministry take the place of knowing him. You can be a part of something that's big just to find identity in it and never really know him. There is nothing that compares with your ability to be with Him. And that is true Christianity, knowing Him and living from the place of knowing Him where His heart and your heart become one, where the love that He loves with is the love that you walk in, where the mercy that He's shown you is the mercy that you give. Yeah. Righteousness. Repentance and remission of sin. Remission of sin translates into righteousness. It means just as if I've never sinned, standing without any sense of guilt, condemnation, or shame, total access to my Father. Righteousness. Man, you ought to wear it every day. 
and look beautiful in it. Adam and Eve are in a garden. They've sinned. They're standing naked and ashamed. They hear God coming and they run and hide. That's pretty weird. It's what sin does. It makes you run from the very one that's so lovely, that loves you so much, that wants to bring redemption, the answers, the promise. He wants to come and proclaim that your seed will crush his head. He, God is God. He's a covenant God. That's why he came down. He's a father. And what did they do when they heard the steps of their father? They ran and hid. Why? Because God changed? Because sin consciousness was ruling their soul. And they ran from one that loves, that wants to restore, that wants to bring truth, that wants to show mercy. And when he comes, he says, how did you know you were naked, Adam? Did you eat the tree? And the rest is history. Obviously, Adam, I shared it this morning. You know, it's a funny thought in the sense, but it's a sad thought. He, he says, it's the woman you gave me. And what is this you've done, Eve? Well, it was the devil. He made me do it. And Just blame shift, self-justification. The first sec- effect of sin is self-centeredness, self-consciousness, self-protection, self-justification, self-defense. Hey, don't look at me. It has to be somebody's fault. Hey, if you wouldn't have gave me the woman, probably wouldn't have ate the tree. Well, hey, don't look at me. The devil made me do it. All of a sudden, we let people be the reason for our being. Instead, well, I wouldn't feel this way if it wasn't for, well, you don't know why. Well, why didn't God change them? Well, they put so much pressure on me. Well, I wouldn't be like this if it wasn't for so-and-so. No, you ought to be able to say, I wouldn't be like this if it wasn't for Jesus. I ought to blame it all on him. (laughs) Come on, well, if God, if well, if my spouse, if they wouldn't... What does that have to do with who you are in Christ and your ability to commune with God and keep your heart clean and pure and manifest the truth of the gospel? Why are you letting your spouse be Lord? Why are you letting them be the truth that dictates your life when it's not even the way? So if they're going through a hard time, why is it so easy to cry because of them instead of cry for them? Why do we only pray because we're frustrated with them and we know if God would change them, it would make our day better. Why don't we weep when nobody's looking and say, God, there's so much more than they're living. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing or seeing. And God, would you have mercy? Because the one prayer doesn't even leave the drywall or the drop ceiling. The other prayer goes into the bowls of incense and is heard at the throne of God. It's faith working through love. One is driven by need and selfishness. And God, I can't believe if you love me, why do you let my boss treat me that way and spew on me? God, I'm more than that. And I am so sick and tired of my boss spewing on me and treating me like garbage. God, if you love me, you think you would change him. Why are you letting him do this? That isn't Christian prayer. That's a complained, self-centered, selfish, self-righteous session that God's not even in the middle of. That's you demanding your rights and you're supposed to have given them all up because you denied yourself. Why? You were never made for yourself. You were made for the image of God. Read the book. Let us make man in our image. The day you eat the tree, the image dies. I'm going to send Jesus and model a life you were created for and I'm going to bring the image back and get it inside of you and the image is love. So you ought to cry for your boss and you ought to model Jesus to him and the more he squeezes you, Jesus ought to be pouring out everywhere. (laughs) Simple. Not praying to the pastoral staff or asking them to pray for you that you get a better job in a Christian atmosphere. Are you kidding me? I will never pray that for you. Stay where you are and be a light. The Bible says that we're to do all things, all things. How many things? All things without grumbling and complaining. How many things? Oops, we could have an order call now maybe, but there's a lot of people here. Do all things without grumbling and complaining. Why? Why? So you are revealed to the world as innocent and harmless in the sight of people that are twisted and don't understand life. Why do you do all things without grumbling and complaining? So they see who you've become. And they see you as harmless and innocent and without agenda and motivation that you're surrendered, you're sold out and all you have is love. It says that you shine forth as a light and hold forth the word of life. That's a Christian. Why? Because right before it says do all things without grumbling and plainly it says it's God who works in you both to will and do for His good pleasure. And His good pleasure is to reveal His nature to people that don't understand. If we turn into Christianity, into what God can do for us and having a better day, we are going to miss it terribly and be discouraged Christians. You do never gather in a service like this for what God can do for you. You come to look more like Him, to be sharpened, to be edified, and to leave this church looking like a son and daughter of God. I'm serious. If we think this gospel is just about us having a better day, we are set up for a tough ride. 
It'll turn into the great escape. You'll be even where, God, where are you? I thought you loved me, and why isn't anything going my way? And when am I going to get my breakthrough? The temple curtain is tore already. The stone's rolled away, man. There's been an amazing breakthrough. (laughs) And the victory of that breakthrough lives inside of us. (laughs) Yay. (laughs) It's not time to be discouraged. It's not time to think for yourself. You think for the kingdom. Man, Mordecai and Esther way back in the day understood that. He said, man, think not of yourself. Is it possible you were born for such a time as this? Don't think of yourself. And as a and, and typifying Christ is a type and shadow of the things to come. She does that very thing and plays the role of Savior and gives her life at risk to save the nation. Why? Because she thought not of herself. When you're discouraged, who's your mind fixed on? When you're disappointed. I'm telling you, there, there, if we followed Jesus' life, you would throw away every reason to ever be discouraged. Here's the thing. We don't want to separate sometimes from what we've known all our lives because we think it's normal. But none of that stuff is your creative value. None of that is who God made you. It's who we became when Adam ate the tree. We were born into Adam and you must be born again. So all things change and your mind's renewed and everything's new. And the way you think and see and if my eye is, is, is single... My whole body's flooded with light. It doesn't say unless, of course, you're faced with many challenges or issues. It says the eye is the lamp of the body. If I see clear, I live clear. If I see clear, I manifest clear. No matter what I'm going through. Why? Because I see through truth and truth makes me free. And now instead of needing ministry, I have something to give. In the face of adversity, church, do you see passion in me? Just a little? Do you know why? Because everything I've been through. I don't have a philosophy today. I'm in love. I'm not preaching doctrine to you. It's my life. I'm preaching my relationship. Jesus is very real to me. He happens to be Lord. And guess where he lives? Because he wants to. Right on the inside of me. I've been a house fit for a king my whole life and didn't even know it. I've been prime real estate and didn't even know it. He could live anywhere he wants. He could put a castle in the sky, a huge thing, man. And everybody from the north, south, east, and west could see it at once and teach their kids, go, whoa, that's where God lives. (laughs) But he doesn't do that. He's not into that. He wants to live inside of you. So people look and say, that's where God lives. Whoa. Whoa. The gospel's all about Christ reproducing himself after his own kind. If God made man in his image and the image was lost, when man ate the tree, then the reason for Jesus is to redeem us back to the image, not get us to heaven. The finished work of Christ is not fulfilled and exalted when a man prays a prayer to get his name in a book called life. The finished work of Christ is fulfilled and exalted when a man's nature is restored back to the image of God and he becomes love. Anyone can have an issue. Anyone can have an attitude. It is normal and seems common for men to be angry, disappointed, jealous, pride, and frustrated. But my Bible says put off all those things because you were never made for those things. You were made for the image of God. And everything else is a misuse of life and a perversion. And that's repentance. Change the way you think. And God is willing to remove every sin. Yay. It's not about just sin and be forgiven and keep on sinning and be forgiven. No, no, no. It's the stewardship of your heart. Wait a minute. I understand what I was created for now. Why would Jesus pay such a price for someone like me? That's what people say. Because he paid a price for who you're created to be, not who you've been. He paid a price to redeem what you were originally designed to be, not what you've been. He wants what you've been to die so you can rise up and finally live. Unless the seed dies and falls to the ground, it abides alone. But if it would ever die and fall to the ground, it'll spring up and bear much fruit. Eat seed after its own kind. Little Christ-like ones. Christians. (laughs) Doesn't mean church attenders. It means the church. Come on. This is the blessing of a meeting house. I'm looking at the bride. We don't build buildings and pay homage to God. We become like him. We don't do service to the Lord. We're sons and daughters that manifest his life. If you don't do that, you'll get tired. If you don't do that, you'll get weary. If you don't do that, you'll backslide. Your flesh will get a louder voice than your spirit. And you'll justify weakness and come up with thousand reasons. Why? 
this and that and the other. And it's all deception. Grace is with us. The work is finished. God is well able to transform our lives if we're willing to be molded by Him. I say this everywhere I go. Not everyone in the church is willing to become love. We want to hold on to the rights we inherited through the fall of man. We want to hold people accountable. Well, you better be glad God isn't holding you accountable at the level you're talking. Or he'd have waited for you to change before he sent his son and you'd really be in trouble. While we were yet sinners, he sent his son. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 5. You see why I didn't open the Bible? Because it's inside of me. Have you noticed I spent time in that book? <laughs> Scriptures are just bombarding me. It hardly seems fair. It's just, it's just so fun. It's all, there's no, I just love it. Because <laughs> it's life. It's truth. You know what will make you free? Truth. Truth. I'm not against order ministry. I'm not against praying for each other. But I promise you, it doesn't say that ministry and prayer makes you free. Truth makes you free. Ministry and prayer can open the door to some things and pave the way for some things. But if you don't replace lies with truth, you will never walk free. I'm being straight. I'm being real. Truth makes you free. Truth is your best friend, and it's not letters on a page. It's a person. His name is Jesus. And the spirit of truth is Holy Spirit. He lives inside of you, and you're to commune with him. Yay. (laughs) You see the good day we have? You say, yeah, but it's not going good for me, brother. See, you get your eyes on that and miss the truth that makes you free and causes you to see that the right way. Because I'm not saying everything's going great for all of us. I don't have joy because my ducks are in a row, I promise you. I have joy because he's my father and loves me and his love will never fail and I finally have confidence to live my life. And come hell or high water, the response is Jesus. Because I love not my own life unto death. I've surrendered, remember? I've denied myself, picked up my cross and followed him. We've turned it into a prayer to go to heaven. We've turned it into a street corner prayer to go to heaven. About a hundred years ago, we came up with the sinner's prayer. And Jesus never said that. I'm not against the sinner's prayer. I understand the concept. But if that's the only motive, we're missing the point of transformation. A man must be born again, not pray a prayer to go to heaven. You must be born again. That means old things dying and new things living. It has never been Jesus incorporated. We were in a service in Arkansas and a young man left the service. He was driving home and the Spirit of God came in his car and said, You have been the CEO of Jesus Incorporated and you are fired. (laughs) I love that stuff, man. This young guy pulls over and goes, Jesus says, I love you. And I'm stamping the word redeemed on your forehead. And from now on, you will be my son. I thought, man, if that kind of stuff happens when I preach, I'm just going to keep preaching. (laughs) Might not look good right now, maybe, but if they get in their car, he might come. (laughs) I'm excited. Forgive me for being half a flake, but I'm just excited. Come on, man. You want God coming into your life and doing that. He's a father. It didn't condemn him. It changed him. He realized, man, I've just added God to me for what he could do for me instead of how he could make me more like him. I haven't surrendered. Why did Jesus say, deny yourself? If any man come after me, let him first, what? Pray a prayer to go to heaven? He did not say that. He said, first deny yourself. Why? You were never made for you. You were made for the image of God. And Jesus came and modeled a life that we were designed for and created for and fulfilled what Adam failed. And now we're all born again through him and all partake of him. And he's the firstborn among many, brother, and we're predestined to be conformed to his image. And man, if he predestined us, he called us. And if he called us, he justified us. If he justified us, he glorified us by filling us with his spirit. It's all in Romans 8. It's right there, middle of the chapter. It says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us... Who can be against us? If God, if God did not spare his own son, but delivered him for us all, how shall he not give us freely all things through the son? What's he talking about? Full vats and barns? Everything necessary to be like him. He's talking about predestined to be according to his image. 
And if God didn't spare his son but gave him, how shall he not give us everything necessary to be like him? All we have to do is be willing and put off the old and give up the rights and say, you know what? Everything I was trained as a youth from a youth in the world, everything that the fall of man taught me, it has to go. I'm putting off all these things that are concerning the flesh and from this day forward I'm pursuing living by the Spirit. Because if I live by the Spirit, I will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I'm not damned with a dual nature. The kingdom of God is inside of me and I'm his son. Come on, that's militant, that's prayer, that's confession, that's supplication, that's declaration, that's our lives. Or we're going to get reduced to, oh my God, is it six o'clock already? Another day at the old grindstone. God, when are you going to get me through this season, get me another job? And oh God, Billy, you know he just gets all my nerves. Please, God, touch Billy. (laughs) And we call that prayer. Did you pray today? Oh yeah, I'll pray. (sighs) Prayed for a better day. <laughs> Am I okay? <laughs> you guys all right? You all right? Okay, good. Good. What time? What time? I don't want to blow things up. I, no, no, I, I, I do. Yeah, because we got kids and service and workers and. What are we? Give, but tell me. You got to tell me, man. I am bad with that stuff. You got to give me a. It's not a religious spirit. Holy Spirit's not going to leave. Tell me. Give me a time. Huh? No, no. But you need to give me a time. I'm asking for a time. Quarter of, good. That's what I need. I need a marker. I need, listen, I'm one of these guys that you can see the airport, but you're circling, man. And for some reason, you even see the runway, but you just never hear, bring it in. You just, you just circle. You say, well, won't you run out of fuel? Not a chance. <laughs> it's not a chance. No. See, I told Pastor the other day, there's no human being that drinks out of my cup. My head's anointed, my cup runneth over. You get to drink out of my saucer. If you drink out of my cup, I'm going dry. You say, how do you answer so many phone calls, minister so many people? Man, how do you make yourself so available in a conference and let everybody just surround you and talk to them for hours? We do that, don't we, Jeremiah? Who's the last one to leave the church? I am, ain't I? You guys are at the hotel because they got to get up early and come in. I have a little more liberty in the morning, but I stay late, don't I? Talk and pray and shoot. Why? You're not drinking out of my cup. Spirituality is measured by overflow. And love has an amazing resource. (laughs) I'm not doing ministry. I love people. And this well will never run dry. Did you get it? Come on. 17 years in and I'm getting worse. And I'm going to get worse. And the next time you see me, I'll be this way or worse. You know why? Because I'll know him just a little bit more. I'll know him just a little bit more. So there'll be just a little bit more joy. A little bit more zeal, sir. He loves you so much. You know that, don't you? No, no, give me your hand because he's doing something wonderful in you. Just sit there. You don't have to do anything. He's doing it. Yeah, and he's transforming your world, man. And he's showing you your worth and your value. That he's the redeemer of all things. And it's not what about's been lost. And what you've been through. And how it'll never work out. It's about what's come and what's been found. And what he's doing. And I just declare you an answer conscious man. Consumed by truth. Consumed by the love of the living Christ. I bless you with understanding. I bless you with revelation. And the days of guilt, condemnation. And even painstaking memories over for you. I declare freedom in your heart and in your soul. In Jesus' name, be blessed. God, it's just good. Okay. I got to wrap this thing up. Go to Colossians 3 with me. I didn't get to read it this morning, but you guys will get to read it. Righteousness, remember? It's what holds everything together. The reason, this, the reason we pray for the sick is because of the forgiveness of sins, not because they're sick. If the only reason we pray for the sick is because they're sick, we're driven by need and fear encompasses that. And faith doesn't work through fear. Faith works through love and love casts out fear. So we have to have a higher motive for praying than trouble. Come on, I'm trying to teach you something here. We have a higher motive for praying than trouble and knowing what the Bible says and promises about our trouble. Because if it's not because of love, you reduce the Bible to a book of principles you're trying to apply in prayer for a breakthrough. And then you're wondering why things aren't shifting, working, and then all these questions rise up and it subverts your ability to have intimacy and oneness with his love. You're rooted and grounded in love. 
Faith works through love. Love casts out fear. We're not needs-driven people. We're people in love with a covenant of promise. We don't pray because Larry's told he's going to die. We pray because he's promised life and has longevity and has legacy to write and destiny to fulfill. We don't pray for Bobby because he's in trouble and inundated with this. No, because he's more than that through the cross. And we pray from the perspective of life and promise. We don't go, they do they what? They got told, oh my God, we better pray. Call so and so, so so we gotta pray. We do it all the time. We mean well, but we've been deceived into fear and desperation. And a lot of us, if we'd really get honest, are hurt and confused because we've seen so much not answered and we've lost too many good people. And it's confusing. A church this large could fast and pray and wave flags and blow trumpets and pray every scripture that was ever written concerning the situation and do it corporately from the wrong place because of the notoriety of the problem. And you're just afraid you're going to lose another one, so you're trying hard to get a breakthrough. It's the love of God for the individual and the finished work of Christ that makes things new. It's his love for that person. It's not because we prayed right. It's because we believed right. It's the prayer of faith that saves the sick. Believing right changes the situation. It's not you trying harder, praying and digging. I prayed for a friend and watched him die of cancer. I laid on my bed and I said, God, he said, Dan, as much as you're marked by what I'm doing, what you haven't seen still has a voice. And when you watched him losing kilos of weight and you watched him getting thinner and you watched his face changing, you in your mind were saying, oh no, here we go again. It feels like when I lost so and so and so and so. And then all your aggression and momentum was driven by what wasn't happening and what you were fearing the most. But I sounded like a prayer warrior because I know how to pray. But I was praying from all the wrong places that didn't produce life and there was zero authority in my words. It's a good way to use the Lord's name in vain. means without power. I don't know how I got on this. Is this okay? You all right? If we're not careful, I'm not against prayer lines. But a lot of prayer lines have turned into fear lines. And we think the more people praying, the better. My Bible says, one, with a revelation, will speak to the mountain, it'll move. Two, agreeing, touching anything on earth. It's not about strength in numbers in the sense of prayer. It's always about believing. And sometimes we can spread the notoriety of the problem even through a prayer line and make it a rush, hot, ASAP order. As if, hey, if God doesn't break through soon, we're in trouble. And we're driven by fear. We don't realize how we're driven by fear. I've learned that 99% of the time we pray, it's because of what's supposed to be wrong. You can look at a child and see your child turn in wayward, go into a room and cry because they're going off the deep end and cry from all the wrong places, pray from all the wrong places. And absolutely have no rest in your soul, lose sleep and not manifest truth in that whole season because until they come back, you're done. Rather than go in a room and say, Father, I felt this concern when I heard my son say this and I saw my daughter do this. And Father, I thank you for the investment in them and their life is way more than they're seeing right now. There's an inheritance in them and an heritage. And I thank you, Father. And then you go on and live strong and manifest Jesus and be full of joy. Why? Because you believe not what you're seeing, but what you're seeing. And it's way more than that. Or it's just, please pray for my son, please pray for my son. And at every altar call, you come up and cry the same desperate tears. Please pray for my son. And you never wrap faith around the identity and destiny of your son and meet heaven with a heart of faith. And after a while, you say, well, we've been praying so long. Why doesn't God answer? He's given us a sword, authority, the power of his name. And he's shown us the way through Jesus. And the way of desperation and fear and just all about us and what we're going through and sentiment and empathy has not, it does not move heaven. (laughs) You guys good? Come on, I'm trying to help with this thing. I've seen way too much fear eat our lunch. And we're good people. We're good people. The gospel's touched us. We don't wake up to try to miss it. We are not evil people. I'm not preaching this because we have a problem. I'm not trying to correct you or spank you today. I'm saying because we're good people, we try really hard. But sometimes it gets into works and what we're doing instead of resting in what he did in the place of love for that individual. I promise you it has nothing to do with how you raise your voice and how you quote the prayer. 
It has to do with God's unstoppable love. And you need to let it become like a freight train in your heart so it runs everything over in the way. <laughs> okay. Did I turn you to Colossians 3? I'm going to go there. You know what's cool? It's still there. And you know what's even better? It says what it did 10 minutes ago. God hasn't changed. It's there. I'm telling you, it's so good. Watch this. That's something powerful in what I just said. How come we change so much in stuff we go through when he's remaining the same? When you, we justify it. Yeah, but you don't know how it feels, brother. Well, yeah, but you, well, you don't live by your feelings. You live by faith. We spend more time in the church ministering to feelings, impressions, flashbacks, memories. And we fail to live by faith. We actually teach that sensuality is the way we are. No, we're spirit-led people that live by faith. And faith crushes sensuality. And all of a sudden, the devil doesn't have the same access and doorways he used to have. Because if the devil can just put a feeling on you that you're lost, you just might believe it. But the Bible says it's impossible to be lost. It'll never leave you or forsake you. No one's going to snatch you out of his hand. So I don't care if you feel lost. You can't be lost. You just have to thank God for that so that feeling of lost just goes away. <laughs> or you'll go on a year's of journey at an altar waiting for the feeling to go away instead of destroy it with truth. And you'll think you need prayer. No, you just need replacement of belief system. And you need to wipe away the lie with truth. And if you don't fill your heart with truth, you won't even be able to discern a lie. You'll just be a feeling-driven person. You're another emotion away from another need of ministry. And for two weeks, you're riding well. And now you're wondering what else is wrong because I don't feel so good. And you need to learn to stir yourself up and encourage yourself in the Lord and worship Jesus and thank Him for His amazing love and stand unveiled in His presence and thank Him for loving you profusely. That you're his desire, you're the apple of his eye. That he loves you so much that he believes the death of his son is worth your life lived. That on your darkest day, he didn't lose sight of you and knows who he created you to be. Oh, on your most rebellious act, he said, that ain't you. I know who you are. And he hears the words of Jesus, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they do. Because if they knew who they were and filled with the Holy Ghost, they wouldn't be doing what they're doing and saying what they're saying. That's how easy it is to forgive people in your life. If people knew who they were and knew who you were, they wouldn't act the way they do and live the way they do. So why are you letting what they do to you make you cry because of them instead of cry for them because they're the one in trouble? They don't know who they are. So why do you have hurts and issues and pains? Because you're still thinking for yourself and not for the gospel. Be very careful with that thing. Oh, I'm in trouble. Here we go. I'm glad you gave me a time, man. See why I asked for a time? Oh, Jeremiah knows. He's like, please give him a time. <laughs> please listen, give him a time because it's not going to be, we're not going to miss lunch. We're, supper's in jeopardy, dude. <laughs> Big boy wants to eat. <laughs> He's 35, by the way. Birthday yesterday. Yeah. Happy birthday, Jeremiah! I never thought much about birthdays. I'm not a birthday guy myself, really ever was. But the gospel, it's awesome because you're celebrating the day somebody was born because it's the will of God that he's here. Yeah. Jeremiah is the will of God. Well, how do you know that, Dan? Because he's alive. Because <laughs> the Bible says there's a time to be born and that God predestined him before time. And here he is. He's not here because a man went into a woman. He's here because God said so. <laughs> I'm going to read this right before I read this I'm going to quote, quote one more scripture that I didn't <laughs> stop please help me don't know you know I need your help I need your cooperation <laughs> I'm in trouble there's a scripture I wanted to quote a while ago and for some reason I got so excited I went somewhere else and it, it's, it's hit me right now it's how Holy Spirit works with me I have no power over the way I preach, man. I yield, kneel, and say, have your way. Take me over. And he goes, okay. Well, I think he has fun with it. He just hits me and blasts me with scriptures. And it's like, how do you know the word like that? I say, I have no store bank of knowledge. I've just put it in my heart, and it goes, pow. But 2 Corinthians 5 is bombarding me right now. Where the apostle Paul, I think it's verse 13, he says, it's the love of Christ that compels me. You know what compel can be defined as? Like the fuel in your tank, your motivating source. It's the love of Christ that keeps me moving. 
because I judge something. If one died, then all died. And if we live because he died, then we who live ought to no longer live for ourselves, but for him that died. And therefore, judge no man any longer according to the... That means you don't limit and regulate and deem a man according to his face value, but you always see a man for his potential, his destiny, and his created inheritance. It doesn't mean you don't correct. It doesn't mean you don't have to put discipline in place at times. But you never do it at the cost of the identity of the person. You always do it because you know the person is way more. You don't just correct because they're wrong. You correct because they're way more than what they're living. I'm going to make a strong statement. If we understood the gospel, there'd never be another hurt Christian. No one ever would leave a church again for the wrong reason. Ever. If we understood the gospel. Because it's never been about you. It's about him in you and manifesting love. We've turned into church shoppers. We go to test atmospheres. We go to see if there's love in the place. Well, it ought to be you're there. (laughs) And then you leave and say, boy, that wasn't a loving church. Well, it should have been you were there. Why are you going to look for love when you're called to be filled with it? And you reveal to the enemy and everybody that's listening, it's just all about me. And you're a sitting target for adversity. And you'll say all the right things and do all the right church things and have a heart that's a million miles from truth. And in time, you'll find you've been a hurt and hard-edged person and you're called to be like Christ. I'm not talking to anybody in here. I'm just saying. I'm not pointing to anybody. I'm just making a statement. It's like, man, we're the stewards of our heart. It's okay to talk this kind of stuff. There's not an ounce of condemnation in this. When you hear a fellow blowing up like I am today, don't walk out here and say, boy, I barely feel like I don't even know if I'm saved. It's not a, that's a wrong ear. When you leave here, you say, wow, doorways have been opened and pathways of light to show me what I'm called to and where I'm called to go to. It's not about where you're not. It's about where you're called. It's not about what you've missed. It's about what you're ready to fulfill and what you're willing to walk into. So come on, let's be able to talk like this so we can cheer each other forward. You get it? It's not about what we're lacking. It's about our potential and fulfilling destiny. So if our hearts are sincere, it's easy to hear words like this. And we leave and we go, oh my goodness, God, thank you for this. And I'm encouraged here. And wow, I see. And wow, ooh, ah. And then you get the CD and find out there's even a lot more ooh-ah-sahs because you only got a little bit of it because I'm going blah, 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 because I'm only here one morning. So blah, 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 blah. Hey, I got one crack at y'all. Somebody said to me, man, sitting under you wasn't like getting a drink. I was like a fire hose, dude. That's what he said. One guy came up to me and said, you did me great injustice this morning. I said, what? He said, you didn't pour me a glass of milk. You dumped the truck on me, dude. And I said, well, what's wrong with that? He said, because how can I possibly retain all that? I said, no, no, no. You are not called to grab everything I said this morning and recite it and repeat it and live up to it. The things that touch your heart, when a man like me is crying out, the things that grab your heart is what God's saying to you right now in your season. You don't have to retain everything I cried out. But there's a whole lot of you and you just got me in machine gun mode because God loves you and he's trying to touch as many people, as many things and make us all more edified and encouraged and ready to run. <laughs> it's, isn't it amazing when you preach like that? A whole bunch of people come, man, you were talking right to me. That sermon was for me. And I'm thinking, ain't that funny? 50 people think it was for them. <laughs> That's encouraging. It's because God knows his kids. And he has the ability to just go... Pfft. Okay, oh, I'm late. I got to read. No, I just got to read. I got to read. Colossians chapter 3. If then, if, that's a little Greek word that means since. He's not questioning your salvation. Since you were raised with Christ. He's not saying, well, if you're saved, live this way. He's not testing your salvation. It's important to see your Bible and know what it says. He's not, he's not testing and challenging. Since you were raised with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Now watch. The love of God tells you to do this. Set your mind on those things. Why? Because he knows your mind is tempted to drift everywhere else. And that Satan even is speaking things and memories and flashbacks and human wisdom and the way that seems right to man. And all this stuff's trying to eat your lunch right here. So set your mind on the way heaven thinks and the way heaven works. 
set your mind on the heart of God and love and the things that are from above, right? Not on the things of the... Why? Because you died. You did not pray a prayer to go to heaven. You died. Look, we were buried in baptism with Jesus into his death. And if we were buried into his death, surely we'll be raised in the newness of life. For if we were buried in the death of Jesus, surely we'll be raised in his resurrection power. It says he who has died is free from sin. Why? Because he's free from himself and selfishness is the root of every sin. Oh, that's amazing. He who has died is freed from sin. He's not going to live in his own strength, his own works. He's going to live by grace. And then it says, the death he died, he died to sin once for all. Likewise, you reckon yourself dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. That's how we wake up every morning, right? Come on. We're not waking up and trying not to sin. We're waking up enjoying being good sons. We're waking up enjoying being vindicated and justified and redeemed and loved by God. And we're thanking Holy Spirit that he's right inside me and he's with me. We're not praying for a breakthrough. We're thanking God it's come. Serious. Okay. You died. You died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Therefore, uh uh-oh, here we go. Therefore, therefore, what's it there for? Because of this truth, therefore. Don't just read a a therefore without knowing what it's there for. Always back up and find out what he's writing in light of, he's just said. Because you'll get into legalism. You'll go, therefore, put to death. You get a preacher, just come in here and say, now listen, you need to put to death the members of your... Why? Because you've been raised with Christ and the kingdom of God lives in you and your image has been changed and transformed back to God. So we're going to put to death these things. How do you put to death the member of your flesh without biting your lip and getting into works? Oh, you better hope I have the answer now. <laughs> How do you put off anger? Look at, look at verse... Look, look. Put off the members of, of, of your flesh, and of the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire. Look, it says, which all you once lived and walked in. It says, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming to the sons of disobedience. Watch. But now you yourselves are to put off. He doesn't say manage. He says put off. Put off anger. Put off wrath. Now, how do I put off anger without trying not to be angry? How do I put off anger without biting my lip and making it a resolution that I'm not going to be as angry as I used to be and I'm going to get a grip on it? And now I'm just going to try. And now then you have all, you're still all angry and you're just. <sighs> do you follow me? How do I put these things off without trying harder and being condemned in my failure? Who's ever been in that cycle of Christianity? Here's how. You get alone with him in relationship and you start thanking him that you were never made for yourself, for your own identity, for your own reputation, or for the dictates of flesh, that you are a man, a woman of the spirit. And Father, everything that you made man to be is who I am on the inside and you are restoring me to your image. Anger has nothing to do with my created value. I have no right to be angry. I have no right to be full of wrath and malice. I have no right to be jealous and proud because I've become love, because I have given that life over so that I could obtain you and you could live in me. Father, I thank you that you've made my heart full of mercy, full of love. I thank you you're redeeming my emotions and my makeup and everything the world has taught me is being subdued by the one that lives inside of me. I thank you anger is not my lot in life, but I am a man of love. You get in your prayer time with God, not a confession sheet, with God and let him be your father and you dare be his child. And you declare that who he is is who you are on the inside. You don't go into prayer from where you're lacking. And God, please make me this. And please help me with this. And please, God, this. No, no, no. You thank him that his good pleasure is to give you the kingdom. And you are transforming my life. You are making me a gentleman, a kind man. I am a man that's full of mercy because mercy has overtaken me. And I put off all these things. I was never made for these things. I was made for your image. And it was your good pleasure to send your son and redeem the truth about my life. Do you get it? Yay. So now you're going to put these things off. Don't lie to one another. Well, why wouldn't you lie to one another? (laughs) Simple, because you put off the old man and his deeds. You're not a liar, you're a saint. 
You're not a liar. You're a man and woman of the Spirit. You're not a liar because when you lie, you're saving yourself, preserving yourself, drawing something to yourself. Why would you lie if it wasn't about you? So we're not going to lie. Why? Because we've died. We've put off the old man. Lying's not even an option. It's not even, it's not even part of the kingdom. Heaven doesn't even understand lying. <laughs> We just relate to it because we grew up in it. I remember breaking. I told him yesterday, I broke a lamp at home. We had a matching set of lamps. And I broke a lamp roughhousing with my brother. And it was my fault. And I looked at him and said, oh, you're in trouble now. He said, don't look at me. You broke the lamp. I said, ain't no way, man. I ain't getting whooped for that. And my parents come in, what happened? And I lied through my teeth. I remember as they were, my dad was dragging my brother away to whoop him. He was drinking. It wasn't a pretty day. I mean, when he took off that belt, you was getting whooped didn't happen a lot, but when it happened, it happened, and it hurt. And I said, I'm glad it ain't me. And my mom, I remember looking at me crying, saying, you better not be lying. Because we went through this, and he said, I can't believe you. And I said, I stood there, and I lied through my teeth so bad that I convinced my parents it was his fault. Do you hear the opposite of Jesus? He came innocent and took the rap. You hear the perversion of the fall? At the cost of my own brother, I lied to protect and preserve myself. That's the fall of man. Jesus, even if he didn't break the lamp, would have said, put it on me. I did it. Whip me. Don't whip him. Jesus would have jumped in front of me and took the whooping. Here I am lying through my teeth so he gets it and not me. It's called the fall of man. And I remember looking at my mom going, I didn't. He broke it. And I was just so glad it wasn't my butt bruised and hurt. And my brother came back. I can't believe you did that. I said, hey, man, whatever. Ain't that something? The gospel's the total opposite. Why wouldn't we lie to one another? Because we're changed. We didn't pray a prayer to go to heaven. Are you kidding me? Heaven has come inside of us and ravaged our hearts. We're not waiting for a bus to pick us up. The kingdom of God is here. We're not people that confess Christ. We're people that manifest Christ. We're not people that quote the word. We're people that have become the word. And our identity isn't in our ministry. It's in the transformation of our hearts. We're not going to lie. We put off the old man and we're putting on who? The new man. He's renewed. Look who he is. He's renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who made him, created him. Therefore, verse 12, is the elect of God, holy and beloved. Listen to the heart of God, church. Let this be our closing time of prayer. Put on tender mercies. Put them on. I'm made for mercy. If I've been forgiven of everything I've ever done, then I taste the joy of that and it makes me become forgiveness. If I've been loved unfailingly, it touches me so deeply that now I become love. Why? Because the greatest, two greatest commandments are all wrapped, everything's wrapped up in two commandments and they're one. He said the one is like the other. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. There's no one on the planet that truly, truly has this in the way it's designed and doesn't have this. Because the whole purpose of this is this. And if you don't see yourself clear, you won't see your neighbor clear. You love your neighbor as yourself. So the clearer I see myself in the Lord and see myself in the mirror in Christ, the better view I have of you. And the more I receive his love, the more I love you. But if I have discrepancies of soul, hidden guilt, shame, condemnation, criticism, introspective with negative reviews, well then I'll find, criticize and see what's wrong in others because that's the eye I live by. But if love rules my world, then I can love you. Did you get it? So if I'm really free from me, what's the end result? I'm free from you. And now I can finally love you. And it can finally be the way it was created to be. If I meet John and I put expectations on John that determine who I am and how I'm doing, I've done a great injustice to him. Because now I've set him up to fail and disappoint me and me to be less than who I am in Christ. And when I hear John's name, all I can think is what he didn't fulfill. And all I can remember is what he didn't complete and lose sight of the destiny and the potential of John's life. Why? Because I put expectation on him at the cost of both of our souls. 
says, you owe no man anything but to love. If I need John to do something in my life for me to be okay, I've got him in a wrong position. John isn't Lord, Jesus is. I need him to be trustworthy. I need him to run the race. I need him to live honorable in that sense of the church running together. I understand that, but I don't put my trust in flesh as if to John would miss it. I have a justification to be less than and let sin against me produce sin in me. Jesus never let sin against him produce sin in him. He just manifested all the more. So put on tender mercies, church. Kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another so that you're forgiven? No. If anyone has any complaint against another, even as Christ has already forgiven you, you also forgive. And above all these things, church, that's put on love. It's the bond of perfection. Can I pray over you guys as a house? And I'll turn it over to your pastor who I love and adore. Father, I just thank you for the great honor of pouring out my heart this morning. I thank you for the great honor of this congregation, your people. And I just thank you that the revelation of righteousness lives and abides here. I thank you for the teaching they always receive on the Father's love. And I thank you that today we have an increased conviction that we're not in the position just to be loved by you, but to become that very love. And that as we go, we go looking like you. Father, thank you for our spheres of influence. Thank you for the places we can impregnate with your wisdom and your will. And just thank you that this calling is a whole lot bigger than you just taking care of us. It's you transforming us. So we put ourselves in position and say yes. And like clay would do to the master potter, we just yield ourselves to the master's hands. And all your creativity and all your wisdom and all your design, let it come out in that clay. So we're yours We're yielding and we're saying thank you for making us like you. In Jesus' name, Father, I bless this house and I thank you for the grace on it. Amen.